Radio enthusiasts, welcome to another video on early radio from the Roaring Twenties Antique Radio Museum. I've had requests from subscribers for a video explaining how early radios were powered. To honor those requests, in this video we will investigate what power sources were used in early tube radios and how they evolved. The first radios that started the radio revolution with the public were called crystal radios. These radios could pull music and voices out of thin air with no visible power source. This was shocking to people living in the early 1900s who had no idea how such a simple device could do such a thing. Many people thought it was a trick, and others proclaimed it as the device of the devil. But to many young boys, the crystal radio was a thrilling new invention that fired their imaginations. Long before radios were sold to the public, young boys, men, and even some women took a strong interest in radio and began building their own crystal sets. These early crystal radio pioneers would then demonstrate them to their friends and families, who would be amazed when they put on a set of headphones and heard these strange voices or music for the first time. The radio revolution was underway. Although radio had been around for some time, radio had been the domain of scientists, inventors, scholars, the military, and naval ship-to-shore communications. Now the general public was taking notice of radio. Although they became hugely popular, crystal radios were crude and severely limited devices. They lacked much selectivity and needed to be relatively close to whoever was transmitting, compared to later receivers. However, the solution for these drawbacks began to take root almost half a century earlier. In 1875, Thomas Edison was working on the development of the electric light bulb when he noticed that electricity could flow through a vacuum. The electricity would flow from the hot bulb filament to a metal plate at the bottom of the light bulb. It would be eight years later, in 1883, before he would announce his discovery as the Edison effect. Six years after Edison's discovery, a British radio engineer named John Ambrose Fleming, working for the Marconi Company, invented the thermionic vacuum valve, or tube. In Europe, tubes are referred to as valves. Fleming's invention was a rectifier tube that can, could convert AC power to DC power. Fleming continued to refine his invention and patented it in November of 1904. Building on Fleming's invention, an inventor named Lee DeForest was working on a way to amplify the radio signals that were received by a radio. After much trial and many failures, DeForest finally succeeded in his endeavor and created the first successful signal amplifying radio tube in 1906, which he named the Audion. The Audion was the missing piece of the puzzle that eventually made radio a must for all American homes. By 1917, the military was using radio tubes in military communication gear. First used in ship-to-ship -ship and ship-to-shore communications, it would soon be used in the Army Air Corps' biplanes for communicating with other planes and ground stations. The use of radio tubes required a power source for radios. In 1920, only 35% of homes in America had electricity, so some other source of power had to be used. The only other way available to power a radio in those days were batteries. Benjamin Franklin had first coined the term battery in 1749 when he was experimenting with electricity. His electricity came from a series of capacitors, basically glass jars called Leyden jars, which stored electricity but could not produce electricity on their own. It may sound incredible, but the first batteries had been created over 2,000 years prior to 1920 in Iraq. In 1938, the director of the Baghdad Museum in Iraq found the earliest form of battery stored in the basement of the museum. It's now known as the Baghdad Battery and was created around 250 BC in Mesopotamia. There's been no evidence that anything evolved from that first battery. The first battery that led to the evolution of modern batteries was invented in the year 1800 by Alessandro Volta. Volta named his battery the Voltaic Cell, 
By the late teens and the early 20th century, early battery radios were powered by a series of glass jars filled with sulfuric acid, like the Willard battery pictured here. Later, rechargeable lead-acid batteries were developed. In rural areas, farmers would recharge their radio battery using the generator on their tractors. The lead-acid batteries were large and heavy, making them a drawback to owning a radio. This spurred on the development of much smaller and lighter batteries that would be easily replaced once they were depleted. These new batteries were called dry cell batteries, like the one shown here. There were many variations of these early batteries. Most early tube radios required two or three separate sources of DC electricity with different voltages. There were battery radios that required an even larger variety of voltages, but I'll skip those in an attempt to prevent all of us from having a bigger headache than necessary. The power supply for the filament was designated the A power supply. Different tubes required different filament voltages and amperages, usually between 1.1 volts and up to 5 volts, and between 1 quarter and 1 amp, depending on the tube. There was only one A power for a radio. The second source of power needed for a radio was for the plate voltage. This was designated as B power. For one tube radios, like this 1925 Crosley Sky Terrier, better known among collectors as a Crosley Pup, this was all that was needed to power them. If a radio had two or more tubes, like this 1924 Crosley Model 51, the second tube was usually used for sound amplification so the radio could be played through a speaker horn where one tube radios could usually be heard only through a headset. The power supply needed for the amplifier circuit was also called the B voltage. Yeah, I know. Why didn't they just call it the C voltage? Moving on, some radios had more stages of amplification, which meant more tubes. The problem with some of these radios was the more you amplified the sound, the worse it became. Now we come to the C voltage, or bias voltage. The C voltage was needed to supply the grid bias voltage. The C voltage lets the grid regulate the flow of electrons from filament to the plate. C voltages varied depending on the radio, but 4.5 volts was pretty common for most radios. Generally, C voltage or bias voltage was used when the B amplification voltage was 90 volts or more. However, this Crosley one-stage amplifier uses a B voltage of just 45 volts, and yet it too uses a C bias voltage. Adding a bias voltage reduced audio distortion, greatly improving the clarity of the sound coming out of the speaker horn. I did say earlier that I wanted to avoid getting into early battery radios that use more than three voltages, but I do want to show you one extreme example. This is the 1928 Victorine Super Heterodyne receiver. Along with the filament voltage, this Super Het uses two C voltages and three B voltages. Thankfully, radios with this type of power needs were few and far between. Keep in mind the way these different voltages were connected to radios varied. From my experience with over 100 different models of radios from the 1920s, the builders of these radios had never heard of the word standardization. So be very careful when connecting power to one of these early radios. Make sure your voltages and connections are correct before you apply power. The batteries used to power 1920s era radios have long since ceased production, but you can assemble equivalents to the old batteries using modern batteries, like this homemade power supply on the right for the supplying B power to your battery radio, and the 6 volt lantern battery for supplying the filament voltage for 5 volt tubes. There's also modern battery eliminators around today that run on electricity and supply the multiple voltages needed. The K101A is a favorite, but you'll have to look on websites like eBay for a used one since they are no longer sold, but there's still plenty of them around. Another favorite among radio collectors is the RB3 battery eliminator considered the Cadillac among all battery eliminators. Well, I hope I've shed a little light on how the early battery radios were powered. If you decide to become a radio collector or have never owned one of these early radios, I highly recommend them. That's it for this video. There will be more to come as we investigate the early history of the world's first mass medium, radio. Thanks for watching.